being challenged by many of the problems we, we see around us and uh, primarily that of patient blood management and uh, anemia uh, being very prevalent in the uh, both populate all the populations of the uh, patients that, that I see. I want to give uh, say thanks to uh, Professor Vernon Lowe, um, my uh, colleague in, at Grutteskir Hospital for much of his guidance and mentoring and uh, some of the slides that I'm using. Uh, with many co colleagues who are uh, passionate about patient blood management, including Rob Wise uh, and Dave Bishop, um, who have assisted in writing a, a book chapter together on uh, patient blood management, and Karen van der Spey, who also assisted me with uh, setting up some of the patient blood management uh, work we've done at Kruteskid. So tonight, it's there's lots to get through. There's a lot of information um, as we apply some of the uh, practice, the uh, some of the uh, principles that we've learned in the last few modules. Now looking at the perioperative sphere. So one of the things I did tonight was I asked ChatGPT to get involved, and I asked these this artificial intelligence uh, program to imagine a perfect world without anemia and to describe it to me. What would this look like? They describe it as such. In a perfect world without anemia, vibrant colors dominate the landscape. People of all ages and backgrounds thrive, their faces glowing with health and vitality. Children play joyfully in lush green parks. It gets a little bit over the top here. Healthcare is universally accessible with community centers offering nutrition, education, and cooking classes, emphasizing iron-rich foods. Farmers cultivate diverse crops, ensuring fresh fruits, vegetables, and grains are abundant and available to everyone. Does this sound like the ideal world? This is a world that I'd like to live in. Regular health checks are a norm with early detection and prevention practices widely adopted. It's a world where vitality is a shared value, fostering connection and well-being for all. Unfortunately, we live in a world where anemia is the commonest chronic condition in the world with over 2 billion people affected. It's a global health crisis that we're dealing with. Unfortunately, it means that many of our patients presenting for surgery will be anemic. In our ideal surgical world, everyone presenting will have a hemoglobin of 13 grams per deciliter. And then enter up, it will remain 13 grams per deciliter with not one drop of blood lost or whatever is lost is salvaged and transfused back to the patient. And post-operative, the patient has got a hemoglobin of 13, with perfect surgeons, perfect recovery, and everyone is happy. Unfortunately, that's not what we're going to deal with. So we deal with the real situation. Before we go into the practicalities of uh, perioperative iron, I think you need to be recognized that anemia is just uh, detecting and managing anemia is just only one part of the nine field matrix of patient blood management. A reminder that patient blood management being the timely application of an evidence-based medical and surgical bundle of care to optimize patient outcomes and managing and preserving a patient's blood far more than just optimizing red, red cell mass. Now, South Africa has got a large burden of disease. We've got 64 million uh, people, uh, multiple disease burdens, the challenges of maternal and newborn uh, child health, uh, HIV AIDS and tuberculosis, non-communicable diseases are on the rise and that necessitates uh, uh, much anemia, um, iron deficiency anemia, violence and trauma is obviously um, common. Um, the highest proportions of uh, blood transfusions amongst the medical, obstetrics, ICU and general surgery areas. And we know that anemia is common in South Africa. Um, the 2016 South African Demographic and Health Survey uh, indicated 31% in females and 17% prevalence in males. And that's very high in, a, uh, in our society. Now, the question is, what does that mean for our surgical patients? And the SASOS study uh, published in 2018 um, showed that in a large prospective observational study in 50 hospitals across South Africa over a one-week period, a sort of snapshot the prevalence of a preoperative anemia was 47.8%, and this is 3,610 patients. And preoperative uh, anemia was uh, independently associated with in-hospital mortality, odds ratio of 1.6, um, and admission to critical care with longer hospital stays. 
Independent predictors of anemia included an ASA status, three or four, insulin-dependent diabetes, metastatic cancer, HIV, and of course, urgent and emergency surgery. Now, there are multiple causes for uh, patients to present with uh, anemia, or particularly iron deficiency, because we know that iron deficiency is the most common cause of anemia in the surgical population, whether that's due to the chronic blood loss, whether esophagitis, peptic ulcer disease, hookworm infestations, postpartum hemorrhages, heavy instrument bleeding, uh, decreased iron intake, increased demand from pregnancy, it's very common in our population, and of course, decreased iron absorption. I think it's important to recognize that not only is anemia common in surgical populations, but iron deficiency is the most common cause. And most commonly of iron deficiency, absolute iron deficiency is rare, with iron restriction or uh, functional iron deficiency being the most common, up to 94%. Now, the SASO study uh, asked the question clearly that anemia is a big problem in our society. Uh, and there was a subsequent follow-up study to SASOS and a multi-center prospective observational cohort study of Western Cape uh, public hospitals. There were six hospitals, um, studied all adult elective surgical patients, non-cardiac, non-obstetric um, over one week. Um, and fortunately, um, the total of 392 patients were eligible. They found a 28% prevalence of anemia. Uh, those patients had a mean hemoglobin of 10.4. And of those, 37% were diagnosed as uh, iron deficiency anemia. Now, this is based on, on a ferritin of less than 30 or 30 to 100 and a TSAT of less than 20. However, they were missing uh, 30, a number of different um, specimens because of lag times getting them to, to the um, actual laboratory. So what is the impact of preoperative anemia? So in more general populations, and I'm going to really reveal my bias a little bit uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to mention cardiothoracic uh, surgery quite a lot because uh, this is the reality of what I deal with on a daily basis, but I will uh, make uh, statements that are more valid to the wider po surgical population. Now we know that uh, anemia has got negative impact on patient outcomes, results in 22% longer hospital stay, increased rates of kidney injury, infection, 90-day mortality, in-hospital mortality, and obviously a, a large increase in the risk of transfusions, which of course in itself, I mean, of itself is a risk factor for poor outcomes. Uh, in a large audit of NHS cardiac surgical centers, 31% of patients were anemic at the time of surgery with incidence, depending on which uh, center you were at, between 23 and 45%. And if you had a one gram per deciliter decrease in hemoglobin, this was associated with a 43% increase in the risks of odds of a transfusion and a 16% increase in the odds of mortality. Length of stay is also uh, uh, associated. Now, in this, uh, this the further, further, you can see that the there's a significant impact as you lower down on the your hemoglobin gets lower and lower. You can see a clear rise in your risk of mortality and length of stay. So now we balance up these two risks here. We've got the risk of transfusion, and that's the infectious and non-infectious, the risk of transfusion, and the risk of anemia. And that results in you know, a low oxygen delivery, ischemia, and organ, organ dysfunction. Well, the etiology of anemia in cardiac center, it seems to be primarily one of uh, anemia of chronic disease or functional, uh, functional disease. There is some renal associated anemia, but absolute iron deficiency is, is very rare in this particular cohort. What about just iron deficiency? And uh, again, this is in a cardiac uh, surgical center. Uh, that ferritin less than 100 is associated with an increase in 90 day mortality, rising from two to 5%. And this patient is also anemic. There's a large increased mortality risk uh, from 4% to 14%. And this is an st observational study of 730 patients undergoing elective cardiac surgery. And there's a clear increase in the incidence of serious adverse events, as you can see over here, uh, major adverse cardiac events and 90-day mortality. So hot off the press, um, uh, the surgeon that I work with, uh, Dr. Jan van der is one of the co authors on this paper, um, the 2024 uh, guidelines on patient blood management adult cardiac surgery, um, particularly has uh, um, 
sections on the management of preoperative anemia. Uh, and it's important that to recognize that it's common. It's a major predictor of adverse outcomes in post-cardiac surgery. Um, and it's important that uh, transfusions are definitely associated with worse outcomes in this population. And then a high proportion have iron deficiency without anemia and up to 70% of patients. And as I've mentioned, it's an independently associated increased uh, mortality and morbidity. So the recommendation is very clear that um, if there's a sufficient lead time, you can use oral iron, uh, but for more immediate needs, intravenous is necessary. And iron replenishment is a crucial element of modern comprehensive multimodal preoperative strategies, quote unquote. And I think this is a very useful uh, patient blood management approach, both for prior admission and early recognition, identification of anemia, its causes and timely treatment, uh, preoperative uh, management closer to the time, especially with dual antiplatelet therapy, and then intraoperative uh, hemostasis, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, identification of anemia is an ongoing, um, uh, through all three, all four pillars there, the identification of anemia and its timely treatment is uh, it's considered very, very important. So also a very recent uh, publication um, amongst in the, the cardiac surgery realm, uh, the preoperative anemia and anemia treatment in cardiac surgery. There's a large systematic review and meta-analysis uh, this forest plot uh, for the odds ratio of mortality amongst patients undergoing cardiac surgery. You can see there's a lot of data, over 42,000 patients um, versus uh, in anemia with no anemia being 110,000 and in clear increased risk in, in mortality. I mentioned that transfusion is, it has an increased risk um, and this st a study in patients uh, with uh, low risk patients uh, 20,000 patients having long-term follow-up, and the Kaplan-Meier uh, curves do not look good if you even had just one to two units um, of, of packed red cells. Um, didn't make any difference in high-risk patients, though. So again, um, transfusions associated with infection, ischemic post-operative morbidity, increased hospital stay, increased early and late mortality and increased hospital um, uh, costs in this, in this particular study. So obviously we've got now various red cells transfusion strategies uh, that, that have been studied. Um, there's a large um, proportion of research looking at um, uh, restrictive uh, transfusion uh, and all have shown that it is safe to uh, or keep um, a lower hemoglobin around about seven and a half to eight, depending on which study you know, that you've looked at. Um, and rather than going for um, a hemoglobin of 10 or more. And uh, this, uh, the Tartrus study in the, uh, published in the NHAM, uh, primary outcome being serious infection or ischemic events, um, again, showed uh, no difference uh, in outcomes. So obviously there's space specific patient populations that um, uh, would benefit or that we need to be considerate of when we're managing these patients. Uh, obviously pregnant patients where uh, um, iron deficiency anemia is highly prevalent. Um, these uh, patients often require surgical intervention. Uh, and if they're already anemic, they will have blood loss. The cesarean section, you're often gonna get blood loss of 500 to a thousand mils or postpartum hemorrhage. And the definition def differs um, uh, in terms of anemia, according to where you're second or third trimester or you postpartum. Um, I think uh, Professor Lowe has previously mentioned the uh, significant effect of iron deficiency on maternal and fetal uh, outcomes. Uh, and it's uh, shocking once you start looking at the data in terms of um, uh, neonatal and um, the effects of iron deficiency on uh, uh, childhood outcomes, particularly um, uh, intelligence, for example, um, and the importance of early diagnosis and management, I think, can't be uh, underemphasized. And you've got limited time to intervene. By the time you're in third trimester, it's unlikely that oral uh, interventions will be effective and intravenous iron is likely uh, indicated. So this is the question we will hear. Does giving iron help? And uh, the answer is not as straightforward as we might like. So I'm gonna try and spend a little bit more time just looking at some of the, the studies uh, about uh, looking at iron in perioperative situations. 
so why do we want to use iron? It makes logical sense. Uh, we recognize that iron deficiency is common and functional iron deficiency in particular is common in surgical patients. We, assume, we know that it increases red cell mass with time, oral iron and intravenous uh, iron are effective therapies and will correct anemia given, as I said, time and reduce the need uh, for transfusions. Now, this is a very nice paper um, with uh, uh, Beth McLean and uh, Toby Richards, a senior author, uh, summarizing some of the data, uh, giving us an idea of where we are and some of the large trials that have been published in the last uh, few years. I can't spend my time going through all the trials, so uh, let me try and summarize them as, as briefly as possible. So, so, so the FRISA trial looks at a very small population of 72 patients recruited between 2011 and 2014, and these are uh, patients for major abdominal surgery with iron deficiency anemia. Um, so they had a hemoglobin less than uh, 13 in men or 12 in women uh, with ferritins less than 300 and transferrin saturations less than 25%. And they're randomly allocated to either receive uh, a large dose of ferric carboxymaltose up to 1,000 milligrams or the usual care in an unblinded manner, which is one of the weaknesses of the study. And this was given 4 to 21 days uh, before major abdominal surgery. Uh, what was important, and I think was actually a good idea, was that there was a second dose if there was significant blood loss, assuming that 100 mils of blood loss equates to a loss of 0 0.5 milligrams of, of iron. So what they showed was that um, in the IV iron group, the hemoglobin uh, improved by 0 0.8 grams per deciliter prior to surgery, and compared to the usual care group, and four weeks post-surgery at by 1.9 grams uh, per, per deciliter. However, there's no difference in mortality morbidity or quality of life. Now, so that showed some indication that there will be a reduction in blood transfusion and length of stay as well. Um, but as I said, it's got uh, an open label approach. So there was a potential for treatment bias. You know, if clinicians had to, um, decided not to transfuse a patient knowing that that had you know, intravenous iron. In addition, that secondary dosing strategy uh, could maybe compromise the applicability to the preoperative setting uh, alone. However, I would say that uh, that it seems to be, I would say it is a strength uh, in terms of it makes logical sense to supplement patients who have lost uh, a lot of blood um, because you would have lost a lot of iron at the same time. This is probably the, one of the first large trials on the use of preoperative IV iron and is a, basically a starting point for a lot of the subsequent trials uh, that have happened. So the VICA trial um, uh, published in 2019 uh, looked at intravenous iron and colorectal cancer associated anemia, uh, which is certainly a population that um, has got a high proportion of, of anemia. Uh, we recently did a, a study looking at uh, anemia in the colorectal in the ERAS program at uh, Krotoskir. Um, and uh, although there was uh, a high proportion, they were all very treated extremely well by that preoperative uh, setting uh, at Grotesque. So this is, a, again, an unblinded study, repeating oral versus uh, oral uh, ferrous sulfate versus intravenous carboxymaltose. Again, a small, small numbers, 116 patients, no difference in the units transfused. Uh, which was great was that the hemoglobin was uh, greater, there was a greater proportion in the intravenous iron um, uh, group um, by the date of surgery. That's 25% versus 10%. But oral iron was also shown to be fairly effective. I think what's, what's interesting is that um, quality of life was looked at in, in three months uh, post, um, uh, post surgery. And that was significantly improved in the IV iron group. Um, there's possibly there could be some subjectivity there, but I think uh, the, the the quality of life um, areas of um, uh, and the metrics in looking at patients postoperatively um, could be a very, very important aspect to look at when we look at the outcomes of uh, iron uh, in the perioperative sphere and uh, patients being able to better cope with um, activities post-surgery, returning to normality and baseline uh, is an important aspect of when you talk about uh, patient outcomes rather than just the, the crude metrics of 90-day alive and at home. Um, interesting enough, at the five-year survival also improved in those with preoperatively corrected anemia. 
Now, so the, one of the big trials and one of the most important trials published in the last few years was the PREVENT trial. Uh, again, Toby Richards was involved uh, with a well-designed um, uh, randomized control trial um, with uh, ferric carboxymaltose, uh, 1,000 milligrams versus saline uh, in anemic patients presenting for major abdominal surgery. The, the study was um, was blinded, um, it was well conducted, and they did not show any reduction in the risk of death or blood transfusion within 30 days of post-surgery. Um, anemia was corrected uh, in greater proportion of the IV iron group versus only 10% of the control uh, with an improved hemoglobin at eight weeks with lower rate of readmissions. A secondary uh, uh, analysis was performed, uh, which was planned, uh, in the particularly, uh, the, one of the criticisms of the trial was that um, the carboxymaltose was given to pretty much everybody was anemic, uh, not just those that were iron deficient. Um, so they looked at the 82% the, the of the patients who were iron deficient, i.e. ferritin less than 100. And what they showed was that there's a clear effect on the patient with absolute iron deficient deficiency versus um, um, uh, functional iron deficiency with a much greater increase in the hemoglobin uh, levels, um, particularly post-operatively. Post um, so this is uh, looking at the patients who are iron replete. This is a functional iron deficiency patients versus the absolute um, iron deficiency group. And the, the straight, the solid line is the placebo group, uh, the dotted line being the active group, i.e. Uh, received uh, carboxymaltose. Um, and you can see that the efficacy was uh, both in the absolute and iron deficiency, but preoperatively, in effect, uh, that's effectively where the most effect was gained was in the absolute uh, iron group by the time of surgery. I think it's important that to uh, mention that iron has been shown to be extremely beneficial in uh, cardiac failure patients. And there's a number of very well-conducted uh, trials, particularly in the heart failure uh, as I said, the heart failure area. Um, I think it's uh, there's a number of mechanisms that that could be uh, affected, but basically, absolute and functional iron deficiency is very common in this population. Um, Twenty six to thirty six seven percent with reduced ejection fraction, up to fifty nine percent in preserved ejection fraction, and this is at an independent risk factor for all cause mortality. Uh, and in these uh, three trials, they showed improved um, uh, New York Heart Association class six minute walk tests um, and a drop in hospitalizations um, across the board. Uh, and so, so iron is becoming a very important aspect in, in cardiology in terms of the management of these heart failure patients. So what about, um, uh, what are some of the other studies? Um, here's the uh, Cardiff pathway. Again, it's a, a large problem. Of course, this is a retrospective study. Um, but fairly large, 447 patients, and patients were offered intravenous iron uh, preoperatively. Uh, and this study was encouraging. Uh, hemoglobin uh, was increased in successfully treated patients by 1.7 grams per deciliter, um, uh, with a low amount of blood being transfused. And I think what is important is that transfusion was avoided in 54% of patients compared to those 22% unsuccessfully treated um, anemic uh, patients. Now that we're sort of wanting to know what is sort of the, the, the response of the, how can we predict responsiveness? Um, and you can see that um, the fer preoperative ferritin levels are very important for us to uh, recognize and recognize which patients are going to respond. And the lower the ferritin, the more likely it is that they will respond uh, to, uh, to iron therapy. So there's a number of feasibility studies that looked up uh, the, uh, possibility of setting up an iron clinic. Um, uh, this particular study uh, led by Andy Klein, who's well known in the, uh, the iron and cardiac surgery circles, um, demonstrated that patients um, uh, that uh, basically they successfully recruited 228 patients in 11, uh, seven out of 11 NHS hospitals. Um, patients who were anemic received uh, intravenous iron were at higher surgical risk more likely to have known a previous uh, history of iron deficiency at a higher rate of chronic kidney disease and was slightly uh, more anemic. Intravenous iron was admitted, uh, was administered about 33 days before surgery 
um, and preoperative intravenous iron uh, increase the hemoglobin from baseline to pre-surgery uh, by usually around about um, 0 0.8 grams per deciliter. Okay. Um, and an, yeah, anemic patients compared to non-anemic patients were more likely to be transfused and stayed longer in hospital. So uh, the, the conclusion was that the development of an intravenous iron pathway is feasible, but seems limited to selected high-risk cardiac patients in routine NHS practice. Um, and again, and I think this is something that's going to come through over and over again, we need a appropriately powered clinical trial to assess the clinical effect of intravenous iron on patient-centered outcomes. And uh, much as much as mortality, morbidity is important, I think quality of life is certainly going to be an important aspect uh, uh, of um, determining, determining what's the important outcomes that we need to look at. So this uh, systematic review uh, of intravenous iron for treatment of anemia showed no difference in units transfused, ICU stay or hospital length of stay, but did show a decrease in mortality, but not if only robust randomized control trials were included. And this is, uh, ran this is six randomized control trials, only 936 patients. Um, so again, we, we're constantly trying to figure out where is intravenous iron or oral iron going to be the most, most e efficacious. So again, we need to try and figure out what's optimal treatment to correct preoperative anemia and reduce the risk of blood transfusions. Um, so this uh, the study um, it was looked, published in 2021. Um, it's a retrospective observational study of 532 consecutive patients uh, referred to blood conservation clinic. And I think that's a great name. I would love to start blood conservation clinics rather than just sort of anemia clinics. I think... Um, I think the, it shifted to a more patient-centric uh, sort of um, role. Um, uh, so these patients went cardiac surgery, 207 received oral iron, 84 received IV iron, of course this is unblinded, uh, 71 received uh, erythropoietin, 92 had a combination of the two, and 78 received no treatment whatsoever. And what they found was that uh, there was a high increase in hemoglobin if you received intravenous iron of more than 600 milligrams, if you got erythropoietin of more than 80,000 units, uh, and especially if you combine, combine the two. Uh, and if you had an increase in your preoptive hemoglobin, you were associated with uh, less transfusion, which is not really a surprise. So what we're interested in is, uh, this is ITEX trials, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, recruiters and um, uh, trial uh, members at Chrisky Hospital. Um, the sites are now closed. We've recruited all 955 patients, uh, 20 sites across the world. That's quite an exciting trial. So uh, a well-conducted randomized control trial com comparing for ferricarboxymaltose 1,000 milligrams uh, versus placebo in anemic patients uh, presenting for cardiac, elective cardiac surgery, uh, the primary endpoint being number of days alive and at home at 90 days. Uh, and so patients were blinded. So the um, uh, the uh, patient, uh, the recruiters, uh, 60 at the moment, this is what our demographics are looking like with mean hemoglobin at baseline of 11.8, with 40% having uh, evidence of uh, iron deficiency. And that's ferritin less than 100 or transferrin less than 25%. And most of them have undergone coronary artery surgery with or without a valve surgery. So what is important that a lot of them are having uh, the HUDAS scale, which is the disability score. Uh, we're assessing um, the heart disease questionnaire. They're, uh, they're also looking at EQ5D, which is again, looking at quality of life outcomes, both at day 33 and six months after surgery. Uh, so we are eagerly waiting for the publication of this data and we will watch this space. I had to, wanted to have a look at the Cochrane Library. What does that say? So this is back in 2019, it needs to be revised. Um, and this is a very, they only managed to find, well, six well-conducted trials, 372 patients to find a 30% reduction in blood transfusions. They required 819 patients. Uh, so that 372 was well, uh, much lower than uh, what they needed to find a significant difference. And there was, so they found no difference, obviously, between iron therapy versus placebo. And again, there's a uh, problem of low quality evidence. And so the, the jury is a little bit still out. So where does that leave us? 
I think it's still reasonable that we want to optimize hemoglobin. We need to optimize iron stores and we need to figure out how we're going to time therapy. Um, I think it is a mistake to not optimize our patients preoperatively. We need to do everything in our ability uh, to do the best uh, for our patients. Okay. So I think timing of therapy is, is, is vital. Um, this is a very nice um, uh, graphic from the British Journal of uh, Anesthesia Education um, Journal, um, uh, comparing oral versus parenteral iron therapy. Your timing is going to be different because your oral iron treatment is going to take longer. You're going to need a couple of months before the day of surgery. You need an early surgical visit, early laboratory checks and diagnosis of anemia particularly iron deficiency. And uh, and if you've got functional iron deficiency, remember oral iron is going to be less efficacious. Uh, parenteral iron therapy, um, again, uh, we're going to, if it, two to three weeks, uh, you'll should see a rise in hemoglobin of two grams per deciliter. So I mentioned this, uh, Vernon Lowe um, gave me, got these great slides. And I think it's a, it's a very um, a simple way of thinking about it when we are determining when we're going to start therapy on and timing of therapy and uh, this great graphic of uh, when you're going to stop uh, behind a, um, a car to, in good conditions and so where do, where do we start so if we have um, a got a really poor baseline and poor iron status we're going to take much longer to to optimize our patients uh, before surgery um, uh, Obviously, we know that oral iron takes longer to work than intravenous iron, and this is the our speed of the car. Um, and our following distance is our time for surgery. So the more time we have before surgery, the more time we have to optimize uh, iron status uh, and anemia. Um, and uh, the less time, then we need to think of alternative strategies. And we need to think about what's coming up for us. Um, and anyone, I think um, uh, anything we expect more than 500 mils of blood loss um, or a, a expected transfusion rate of more than 10%, uh, we need to investigate the patient for iron deficiency uh, and anemia and prepare them for the possibility that they may need optimization. And there are certain special circumstances. Obviously, you've got an icy road, you're going to have different tires and you're going to have a much longer stopping distance. Um, and we know that patients who have got cancer, they've got inflammation, surgery in itself, there's going to be inflammatory changes and result in poor uh, absorption. Um, uh, pregnancy is a special circumstance as well, uh, post-operative, et cetera, et cetera. And then what's the side effects of uh, particularly oral agents is a, is a factor. And so oral iron, we know it's good in simple iron of deficiency. Uh, but you've got functional iron deficiency, which is majority of surgical patients that are anemic. Um, it uh, tends to be poor, uh, poorly absorbed due to the increase in your um, hemoglobin, uh, your hepcidin levels. So what are the provisos? It'll work if you've got enough time, if it's well absorbed, if there's good adherence uh, and you've taken enough to compensate for ongoing losses, which is, I think is important. Um, what are the challenges of oral iron? <sighs> Yeah, I think uh, I think this has been mentioned previously, but um, it tends to be poorly absorbed when taken with food, particularly your cereals, your phosphates, uh, milk supplements, eggs, tea, coffee. Um, so uh, they should be taken on an empty stomach um, or with form formulation that can be taken with food. There are some new formulations on the market. Uh, pH, um, I need to be absorbed in a acidic medium. Uh, patients with proton pump inhibitors are going to be poorly absorbed. Ideally, should be two hours before, four hours after antiacids. Um, adding vitamin C seems to will be helpful. If you had a gastrectomy, it's completely ineffective. Uh, and enteric coated iron tends to be very poorly absorbed. And the side effects are a huge show, and especially amongst some of you on, in the audience will have taken oral iron. Uh, and we'll know the side effects, particularly gastrointestinal, the constipation, abdominal pain, um, maybe have a flare, inflammatory bowel disease, um, and the adherence rate, depending on uh, the literature, can be quite low. So in the past, uh, I remember uh, training um, 20 years ago, and we used to prescribe iron sulfate twice a day, three times a day, even 
um, and uh, the poor patients, I really feel sorry for them. Um, the new evidence is quite clear that there is better absorption uh, if you take um, dose every second day. So I normally advise my patients Monday, Wednesday, Friday, results in a better response with less side effects whether it's ferrous sulfase or iron polymaltose or whatever formulation uh, you use. Um, and if it's well absorbed and tolerated, you usually should restore hemoglobin within six to eight weeks. Uh, but don't forget, you need to fully replenish your iron stores after the normalization of hemoglobin. So you need to continue taking uh, the oral iron. There are a number of different IV iron preparations on the market, and it, I think it's important to recognize that the new generation intravenous irons uh, tend to be well tolerated with a very low rate of anaphylaxis compared to the previous um, uh, formulations. So the high molecular weight dextrins in particular are very prone to having a, a reaction. Uh, Ferric carboxymaltose uh, is expensive and can be a problem with medical aid sometimes. Um, uh, and but they can great advantages that can be given over a shorter time than the or second generation irons, um, and uh, sometimes as low as fifteen minutes. Um, and they're very well tolerated and um, it's got a great, very efficacious. Uh, as I said, they're more expensive, um, but they're cheaper than a blood transfusion, and have a faster, more predictable response. And if you're approaching a surgery, you're only two to three weeks away, then intravenous iron is uh, pretty much what is the only thing that you can really use. So in practice, we would want to see these patients as early as possible. So there's enough time to diagnose, classify, treat the iron deficiency. Uh, in absolute iron deficiency, there's room for use. Uh, but you need to check the response. And I think it's very important that we recognize that we need to follow up these patients, not just give them blindly, give them uh, iron and just assume that the, everything's fine. Uh, these patients need to be followed up. This is a fantastic supplement published in Anesthesia in 2019 by Munting and Klein. It's a very uh, simple uh, evidence-based approach to preoperative anemia, uh, the who, what, when, why, of uh, preoperative anemia. And this uh, is a fairly simplified um, um, algorithm, looking at ferritin levels, um, recognizing anemia, and then doing simple tests like TSATs, vitamin B12, CRP, and creatinine. Uh, and, uh, and it gives you a very nice flow diagram of what to do uh, in patients uh, with low ferritin levels. Um, and there's a lot of debate at the moment about ferritin levels, whether we're looking at less than 30, uh, some people are saying less than 100 is uh, functional iron deficiency in and of itself. Um, and if we've got, it's important that even you know, if we've got an anemic patient and we've got elective surgery and there's time to, to, um, uh, to optimize, then I think we should. Uh, we need to delay surgery if we can, um, uh, especially if there's cost implications, oral iron would be an idea. I mentioned the ideal world again. Uh, this is the perfect world that we would love to be in, but uh, delaying surgery isn't always possible, especially in cancer surgery. And we know they've got problems with absorption in, in these patients. Um, so patients with functional iron deficiency, uh, recognized by TSATs less than 20%, raised CRP, um, may well necessary that you're going to need to give intravenous iron for these patients. Um, and there are don't forget, I mean, I've mentioned the, the various pillars of the of patient blood management, um, and this is uh, adapted from, from a Jehovah's uh, uh, Witness uh, approach, and a, a, there's a number of targeted therapies uh, that we need to consider rather than just looking at, at anemia. Um, uh, oxygen delivery, um, cell salvage, arterial tourniquet, simple things, keeping the patient warm, are all very valuable in the perioperative setting. The number of different iron preparations available. Uh, carboxymaltose I've mentioned the most commonly, um, but you've got your dextrins with like cosmopher, sucrose, uh, isomaltoside. Um, remembering that one microgram of ferritin is equivalent to about eight to 10 milligrams of storage iron, and it'll take about 165 milligrams of storage iron to reconstitute uh, one gram per deciliter of hemoglobin in a 70 kilogram adult. Um, so if you've got a preoperative ferritin of less than 100 micrograms per liter, blood loss resulting in a postoperative HP drop of say more than three grams per deciliter is going to deplete your iron stores. Um, and if you've got 
patients not receiving preoperative iron therapy, if you've got unanticipated blood loss, you're going to have to give maybe 150 milligrams of IV iron per one gram per deciliter drop in hemoglobin to compensate for that bleeding. Um, remember, so that's 100 mils of blood. It's going to, uh, one mil of blood contains 0 0.5 milligrams of elemental iron. Moving on to the postoperative phase, the limited studies uh, in, in these patients. Um, uh, I've got my slides slightly wrong. I'm going to come back to that. So intraoperative, as I said, there's more than just one thing to look at. Um, so you've got you've got to think of planning what you're going to do about uh, hand, handling, handling this patient. What is your choice of anesthetic? Um, the use of cell salvage, I think, is incredibly valuable. Recognizing, of course, that when you give uh, cell salvage products back to the patient, you don't have, um, you're going to be washing off platelets and uh, uh, factor eight and all your different uh, uh, factors, um, blood coagulation. Um, you want to minimize bleeding. Surgical skill, I must emphasize, is very important. Normothermia, the use of antifibrinolytics like uh, cyclocapron, your tranexamic acid, the use of point of care coagulation tests are very, very important. Uh, and you want to look at the focusing on the delivery of, of oxygen. Postoperatively, as I said, there's limited studies in uh, of postoperative iron. A lot of small randomized controlled trials which show limited effects on hemoglobin. Um, uh, oral iron is very poorly tolerated in these patients with lots of side effects, probably due to the fact that either the um, uh, that they've got inflammation with uh, raised hepcidin levels, uh, preventing well a good absorption of this of this iron. It's a very very low quality evidence, and I've, as I've mentioned, a lot of the evidence comes from chronic heart failure, which shows improvement in quality of life parameters, decrease in hospitalization, exercise uh, capacity. So postoperatively, uh, what are the other things we can look at? Ongoing hemostasis, correction of coagulopathy, uh, iron supplementation, and if you've got, as I said. Uh, I would have a low threshold to, to give um, iron supplementation in, in my patients. And I routinely give um, oral iron. Um, some of the new formulations of oral iron are well absorbed. Uh, and I give it to, to my patients uh, postoperatively if the hemoglobin is low. Uh, I try to avoid transfusion as much as possible. Uh, as I've said, the restrictive um, uh, transfusion strategies are well evidence-based. There is, some, as I said, there's a, a few studies that have shown that um, treating with post-operative anemia with iron uh, may decrease the need for blood transfusions, maybe infection, quality of life, as again, a lot of the data is heterogeneous. Um, so here is looking at post-operative oral iron sulfate in elective knee or hip arthroplasties. Um, the patients did not have preoperative iron deficiency or anemia. There were very uh, small differences in uh, hemoglobin increments. Um, there was only significant differences in two studies, uh, one in hip and or knee arthroplasty and one in hip fracture repair. And uh, the increase is 0 0.76, 0 0.75 grams uh, per deciliter. If you want to know more, uh, this is a good place to look at. It's an international consensus statement uh, on the management of postoperative anemia after major surgical procedures. Um, Again, recommendations are to monitor, especially if your blood loss is more than 500 mils. Uh, if there's high blood loss, you may, it's an early indication for iron replacement. Um, you'll need single high dose preparations uh, if because um, oral iron, as I mentioned, is not going to be well um, absorbed. A restrictive transfusion threshold still apply. And I think this is very important that wherever you are, the patient establishment of patient blood management uh, uh, expert groups I think it's vital in terms of making people aware of the benefits of patient blood management and uh, the issues related to um, transfusion without considering the, the effects thereof um, and, uh, and uh, helping with decision-making uh, around this perioperative sphere. Just a little side, uh, one of my issues is the, the use of um, taking of blood uh, for questionable reasons, um, and uh, this, this study of 2,000, nearly 2,000 patients is involved 221,000 lab tests, and I think the the conclusion was just uh, phenomenal um, that the amount of bloodletting resulted in the equivalent volumes of 332 mils per ICU stay. That's an entire unit of packed red cells. 
um, and some of the patients even more, one to two red cell units. Um, more complex procedures resulted up to 653 mils of loss just due to taking blood uh, for um, uh, for analysis. And I think we need to consider our, our approach in the post-operative sphere. Why do we keep taking blood if, they, if it is not really necessary? So when you are uh, trying to establish um, blood conservation clinics, I think that's a nice term. Um, they are obviously divergent interests. And I think it's a, a useful uh, table from a Rosenthal and the British Journal of uh, Anesthesia. And we've got you know, lots of different stakeholders, the patient, the surgeon, the hospital, insurance companies, and uh, I think that's very valuable in our, in our sphere, the pharmaceutical companies, blood centers, and everyone's got conflicting uh, risks and versus um, benefits. And we try to need to try and balance it in the most evidence-based manner uh, to the benefit of our patients, because that's really, really what we want. We want the ideal world. And I think we are going to summarize briefly and going to wrap things up. We know that anemia is an indirect dependent risk factor for poor outcomes, not just after cardiac surgery, but after lots of different surgeries. It's a modifiable risk factor, and it will can we decrease allogeneic blood transfusion. Uh, we know that patients with absolute iron deficiency will benefit uh, from uh, iron. We know that the primary driver is anemia associated with inflammation, your functional iron deficiency. Um, the, the effect of iron on outcomes is not yet clear. Um, we think it helps, um, but we haven't clearly demarcated which populations are going to get the most benefit. Um, but I think it's important that we need to measure, we need to diagnose, we need to work up our patients preoperatively and early recognition is very important. We need to treat appropriately and we need to follow up uh, both intra and postoperatively. So, I asked ChatGPT once again, so what this ideal world is no anemia. How, what is surgery going to look like in this ideal post anemia world? So ChatGPT thinks that patients are thoroughly prepared for surgery with comprehensive preoperative assessments. They have personalized nutrition plans to optimize their health, ensuring they have sufficient iron levels and overall wellness. They are confident and informed understanding every step of the process. They have a seamless recovery with post-surgical care, emphasizing a holistic approach, integrating physical therapy, nutrition, and mental health support. This really sounds amazing, doesn't it? Patients are encouraged to engage in gentle activities to promote healing, follow-up care is proactive, complications are addressed quickly. In this world, surgery is not just a procedure, it's part of a broader commitment to health and well-being, making as stress-free and successful as possible. And that's what we want. We want our patients to have improved outcomes. I uh, really hope that uh, we can figure out the best way to use, um, uh, improve our patients' uh, perioperative health. Um, and if you've got any further questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you so much. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gibbs, for sharing your view on your um, on your experiences on perioperative considerations in iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia patients. So we have um, we don't have that many questions. So just a reminder that if you would like to put your questions into the chat box, if you would like Dr. Gibbs to answer your question, then we okay. have. One from Maurice Fitzia. I don't know whether you can, can you see the questions or not? Or would yeah, you like I do. To... I've got the questions, yeah. Okay, um, brilliant. Yeah, um, uh, Dr. Katia, thanks for the question. Oh, I really don't know. I know there is a, a couple of centers in Cape Town. Uh, there's a clinic um, at uh, Vincent Pilotti uh, that manages, um, that does iron, there's an iron uh, clinic uh, at Vincent Pilotti, uh, the gast uh, gastroenterology practice. Um, and uh, they've been very successful. They've got excellent data um, in the perioperative sphere. Um, but as to the number of, uh, there's there's a, an MMED waiting to be done. Um, then we also have a question in the chat box. It is uh, with regarding to blood loss in C-section deliveries. And she asks, is it recommended to follow up with oral iron treatment in the postpartum period 
to Absolutely. replenish iron stores. Where is that question? It's in the it's in the chat. So you were I think you only can see, you can only see the questions in the Q and A. This one was yeah the, the, the chat. chat I don't I don't uh, okay yeah. all right okay so so the question is you've had blood loss after um, cesarean section I think it absolutely you should um, uh, I would have a low threshold to to check um, uh, ferritin um, and iron levels uh, post uh, post cesarean section um, and uh, continued um, oral iron therapy for three to six months I think. Um, I think it's in the it's a population that is neglected. Uh, the thought of trying to uh, we know the effects of uh, iron deficiency on uh, tiredness, uh, mental well-being. Uh, there's a, a clear association with iron deficiency and postpartum depression. Um, and so optimizing iron stores in the post-operative, the post-pregnancy phase, I think is absolutely vital. And the thought of trying to look after a little baby um, when you are tired already and uh, iron deficient on top of that, it actually boggles the mind. And I think uh, it's a completely underappreciated um, uh, aspect in, in, in our society. Hey, great. I mean, I think the other questions are now following in the Q&A. Um, there is a question about angular cheilitis uh, with um, hemoglobin levels. I would definitely follow up with my uh, GP um, to have a look at your ferritin, ferritin levels um, uh, and see whether you need um, uh, management of, um, um, of, your, of your iron status. So Pilani asks about um, optimal plan for post-operative Jehovah's Witnesses. We suffer from post-operative hemorrhages. Again, it's a, I think it's a very similar to what I've been talking about in the post-operative sphere. Um, it's very much we want to optimize red cell mass throughout uh, the time period of, of surgery. Uh, uh, it can be a very tricky situation uh, to, to manage, um, but uh, early intervention, early uh, recognition of um, patients who are at risk of, of bleeding is important and um, start uh, early interventions, whether it's use of erythropoietin and combination with uh, intravenous iron, optimizing red cell mass in, in that way. And then, of course, decreasing uh, demand for, um, for oxygen uh, delivery um, and postoperatively. Um, there are a number of different uh, aspects that you can look at and you, using like t t using cell salvage in the post-operative sphere is very common. You can use it in total knee replacements, uh, cardiothoracics, where you take um, uh, chest drains and you uh, reinfuse the blood with a little bit of heparin um, uh, to the patients. Uh, and then, of course, um, optimizing uh, using IV iron or um, any one of the the various uh, methods I've mentioned. A uh, comment from Samira from Nigeria. Fantastic to have you on board um, from Nigeria. Um, yeah, there's uh, remember parasites. The fact is, the matter is, we live in live in. Um, Africa and malaria, for example, is still one of the most common causes of uh, anemia in in the sub-Saharan area. Um, and hookworm infestation, um, deworming patients, uh, it's uh, the sort of thing that uh, we need to be aware of. Um, uh, common things uh, occur commonly. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, um, uh, dietary issues are important. Uh, I think a lot of our patients are. Um, deficient in their um, what they get in their diet. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I was involved with writing a chapter for a textbook um, on patient blood management. Uh, and one of the things we're looking at is, you know, what are the effective strategies for management management of iron deficiency in in uh, the third third world? And uh, some simple uh, interventions include uh, the use of uh, cast iron cooking pots. Um, the small amount of iron that comes off those iron cooking pots improves uh, 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 diets. Uh, the use of iron supplementation in, in bread. Um, 
trying to uh, increase the amount of red meat that's actually uh, available. Uh, and in some cultures, um, uh, some, uh, some areas of the, some people in the culture tend more likely to have um, uh, increased uh, meat intake versus um, uh, being pure vegetarian. And that, of course, if you're pure vegetarian, you need to be aware that you need to have plenty of um, uh, vegetables that contain iron. Uh, others, you are at risk of developing uh, iron deficiency. Uh, so it's look at the context in which you live um, and uh, apply it appropriately, uh, re realizing that um, someone uh, living in a rural area will have a different population to someone in the urban area. And even within the urban area, you will have um, very different sort of patient populations. And um, uh, I think it's important to have a personalized approach uh, to all your patients. So Helena asks, would treating a patient with platelet-rich plasma have an unintended consequence of iron loss? Uh, it's not something that I'm, I'm really aware of, so I don't think I can answer that question, I'm afraid. Are there any other questions? Hey, I also can't see. There's also nothing in the chat box. So if anybody still have um, questions or have questions later on tonight, you are more than welcome to send them on my email address. It was posted in the chat box earlier, and then we will get Dr. Gibbs to answer those for you. But I think um, this, this is going to be it for tonight. So um, once again, as I mentioned earlier, you will have access to the recording of tonight's event the supportive downloadable workbook and attend multiple questions there that you will be able to answer. And the link has been posted in the chat box as well if you would like to follow that link. Um, then you can also register for our next two events that, still, um, that will still be taking place later this year. So um, our next one will be on the 12th of November and the topic would be Ageless Challenges exploring the effects of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in the elderly. And that will be presented by Dr. Claire Barrett, Head of Research and Development School of Medicine at the Health Science Faculty at the University of Free State, who also did our very first presentation in the Iron Masterclass 2024 series. So on behalf of ONOVA, thank you again to all our guests and to those who have never skipped any of the events so far for 2024. Dr. Gibbs, once again, thank you for your time and answering all our questions and uh, devoting your time to us tonight. And then have a lovely rest of the evening. And to the Gauteng delegates, enjoy the first summer rains tonight. I hope it's raining everywhere where you are. Um, and with that, I'm going to say goodbye and good night. Thank you. Hey, everybody.